And Linda has been with us now for our third week. So we are all very much aware of her distinguished CV. And thank you for presenting again. We appreciate it. And again, just a reminder, if you have questions or comments, please wait for the microphone so that our Zoom folks can hear you as well. Thank you. One, two, three. Is that good? Thank you, Steve. And we'll plunge right in. I think that we've encountered, as we read, general coverage of the church and slavery, the church in general and slavery. The abolitionists uh, who stand out from Theodore Weld to William Lloyd Garrison to John Rankin to many others and Frederick Douglass had many searing words to aim at the American Protestant Northern churches because they were so shocked and crushed about how silent they were. Frederick Douglass was absolutely heartbroken when he first escaped in 1839 to find that the Northern churches did not behave or act or speak the way that he thought that they would. And so he was in the forefront of attacking the church. Now this has been um, um, in the additions of these things that come out, sometimes they take out, oh, we have to take out that pat, pat part where he really lambasted the church because that's not nice. So even, even today, we find a lot of editing going on in the works of our own abolitionists where the real hot stuff gets a little softened. So I want to, introduce the word Jeremiah. A Jeremiah is considered a literary form within rhetoric that is like the prophet Jeremiah. And the prophet Jeremiah spoke truth to power in no uncertain words and paid the price. So I'm going to start with our reading for today about Jeremiah. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Trembling has seized the godless. Who among us can live with the devouring fire? Who among us can live with everlasting flames? Those who walk righteously and speak uprightly, who despise the gain of oppression, who wave away a bribe instead of accepting it, who stop their ears from hearing bloodshed and shut their eyes from looking on evil. These are the righteous, but he has plenty to say about those who are not righteous. So Jeremiah is... Um, uh, wail you shepherds and cry out roll in ashes you lords of the flock for the days of your slaughter have come and your dispersions and you shall fall like a choice vessel it's long it's high toned it's going to be really out there in the in the rhetoric that it chooses when the officials of judah heard these things they came up from the king's house to the house of the lord and took their seat in the entry of the new gate then the priests and prophets said to the officials, the people, this man deserves the sentence of death, meaning Jeremiah, because he has prophesied against this city, as you have heard with your own ears. You know, get rid of him. He's criticizing this city. Then Jeremiah spoke to all the officials. It is the Lord who sent me to prophesy against this house and this city and all the words you have heard. Now, therefore, amend your ways and your doings and obey the voice of the Lord, your God, and the Lord will change his mind about the disaster that he has pronounced against you. So now you see Jeremiah saying, you know what? This disaster is not necessarily falling on you if you repent first in time. So it's hell, fire, and damnation in a way. It's hell and brimstone. But it is saying the Lord can change his mind. Now, recently, not too long ago, in the Christian Reformed Church, there was a preacher who preached that the Lord could change his mind. And he was attacked from far and wide. And the Christian Reformed Church did decide to uh, suspend his credentials because he had spoken against what their interpretation was of where the CRC stands right now on the question of whether God Almighty can change his mind. But you found it right here. But as for me, I am in your hands. Do with me as seems good. 
only know for certain that if you put me to death, you will be bringing innocent blood upon yourselves and upon the city and its inhabitants. For in truth, the Lord sent me to you to speak all these words in your ears. So Jeremiah holds his ground and they decide not to kill him and they let him live, but look what he risked. So that's a Jeremiah. That's putting it all out there, telling it like it is and paying the price for it. So when our younger generation, as we began in the first session, says to us, you need to get down on your knees and repent for the crime of slavery in which the Dutch were complicit. And we've looked last time at how that is true and then how it is complicated and color. One of the things that we found out in learning about um, the first Theodore uh, Freyheisen is that he could let her rip also. So down in New Jersey for most of the 1700s, arguments in the Dutch Reformed Church and complaints to the classes of Amsterdam about that Freelingheisen nest of preachers down there, the senior Freelingheisen had four sons and they all went into the ministry. So he starts this way, come here you careless ones at ease in sin. You carnal and earthly minded ones, you unchaste whoremongers and adulterers, you proud, haughty men and women, you seekers after pleasure, you drunkards, gamblers, disobedient and wicked rejectors of the gospel, you hypocrites and dissemblers, how do you think the Lord will deal with you? Be filled with terror, you impure swine, adulterers and whoremongers. Without true repentance, you will live with impure devils and who burn in the vile lusts will be cast into a fire that is hotter than that of Sodom and Gomorrah. All right, this is happening in a Reformed church. <laughs> And he's he's paying a price because not only did the uh, more refined ministers of New York City take up against this Frillingheisen guy, but when the senior Frillingheisen, Theodorus Jacobus Frillingheisen, first came to New York, he was asked to preach in Marble Collegiate Church, the number one church in New York City. And he didn't even use the Lord's Prayer. I mean, that's a broken liturgy. There's a, you know, there, there's, there's a specific place where the congregation repeats the Lord's Prayer after a congregational prayer that is spontaneous by the minister. But instead of doing the Lord's Prayer, Frelinghuysen gives what is called a howling prayer, his style of prayer. And the New York minister tolerates this, but then he invites Frelinghuysen to his home for dinner. And the first thing Frelinghuysen does is criticize the mirror in the minister's front hall and tells him that's a symbol of vanity and it doesn't belong there. What are you doing? So now he's ripping apart the senior minister at Marble Church. So things did not get off to a good start, let's say. And uh, Brooking himself says in this article that I think is part of what you did receive, that the senior Frelinghuysen, he thinks, had a psychotic element and he had a personality disorder that was making him carry on in this ranting way. But his sons translated that fervor and that Jeremiah tone that is a prophetic tone, that is a call to repentance uh, into some of the Reformed Church preaching. So you may have had some difference between the, see, the, the very few ministers there were in New York preaching a more staid sermon that was like a sermon that we've been describing and the more heated sermons that were coming from New Jersey. Along with that Frelinghuysen streak was also a streak of piety, as you can see, and anti-slavery frequently goes with that strain of thinking that was down in New Jersey. Now, Frelinghuysen did have slaves. We mentioned that last week. But now we're gonna take a different look at how the Reformed Church paves the way for the season of the abolitionists who come along and you know, they know this rhetoric and it's coming right out of both some of the Old Testament prophets and what they had learned about that a Jeremiah can be effective. What is the single most, um, does anybody want to guess what is the best known sermon in all of American literature? Oh. That's it. Sinners in the hands of angry God. How how many of you had to read that thing or pretend to read that thing at some point in your reading assignments? It was it was sinners in the hands of an angry God. Yes. 
And when John and my husband, John, and I went to China in order for a statue to be dedicated in front of a hospital for John Adi, I spoke with a um, Chinese student who um, was hoping to come to the U.S. for his college degree. And I asked him what he had read. And sure enough, it was Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. It's in the anthologies that Chinese students today are receiving to be introduced in the eighth or ninth grade to English and American literature. And you, we're going, oh my God, all we need is for all the Chinese people to think this is American religion, this is what it is. But at the end, I once challenged my students. I said I would give somebody enormous extra credit if one student would volunteer to read the whole thing to the class. And somebody did, you know, somebody was eager for the credit. It's long, it's, it depends on repetition. It's just a fountain of this stuff as you could hear from the style. But it comes to a quiet, begins low and it ends very quietly. And toward the end of Jonathan Edwards' speech, you hear this paragraph. And now you have a great opportunity. And then in gentle tones and turning to the young people, to the middle-aged people, and to the old people, to each of them, he says, you have your temptations and sorrows and you need to remember that God has his, the, uh, God has flung wide the door of mercy. So it's the mercy and it's, it's the call, you know, and every evangelist you can think of, including Billy Graham, comes to the call at the end where people come forward and they respond. And when Jonathan Edwards gave that sinners in the hands of the of God, he didn't even get through it. He gave it to posterity in written form. But by the time he got halfway through it, people were already rolling in the aisles and crying and just, you know, bemoaning their sins, waiting for that call so they could, that ending they knew was coming. And now you have a great opportunity. So likewise, um, more often than not, Frelinghuysen's sermons ended with a clear call to repentance. Cursing, lying, adultery, licentiousness, stealing, and similar sins must no longer be found among us. Each of us must search his ways, mourn over, and depart from these sins. Each has done his part toward inflaming the wrath of God, so each must work to extinguish it. A holy reformation and change must take place among us, for this is the only way to sustain a sinking land. I beseech you, beloved, by the mercy of God, by the blood of Jesus Christ, by your spiritual and temporal welfare, by the love you bear your wife and children, by all that you hold dear, turn to the Lord, fall at his feet. And then more, Jesus stands full of mercy. So he's going into his kind of poor oration in the end to be warm and outflowing. And then you see the mercy. Another point about these preachers is that Jonathan Edwards had a whole repertoire of sermons, believe me, and many of them have been published. And one of them is very good that I liked called A Divine and Supernatural Light. And you're saying, now that sounds more like it. If I wanted to choose a sermon to present to the, all the Chinese people who are trying to get familiar with America, I would like to choose A Divine and Supernatural Light equal. Holy Jonathan Edwards, but no. Um, so that sermon probably doesn't deserve that big a place in American literature, but it does exemplify what we're talking about that does come from the Bible. Now, Sojourner Truth, in some of her autobiographies, is often said by her biographers that she's drawing on African mysticism or African traditions when she goes into this kind of uh, style that she had. And in a way, I beg to differ because we do have coming in from the Protestant churches and from the Bible, this stream of ways of rhetoric that had been highly developed in Judaism and in Christianity, and now in the crises that, um, that uh, they were facing. So William Lloyd Garrison's preface to the 1850 edition lets it rip. And in 1850, Sojourner Truth, who we're going to see, really grew up in the Reformed Church more than more, most of us realize. We'll look at that in just a minute. Um, 
she uh, in 1850 was 53 years old and she was bringing out her own story as told to Olive Gilbert, an abolitionist woman who was going to be her go-between, her amanuensis as we call it. And Garrison knows her too. And so he's introducing this. And listen to what Garrison does. Now I'm gonna give you an example of this rhetoric because the Protestant ministers were picking this up and using it in ways that they could. And I'm gonna give you an example in just a minute from, from, from New Paltz. The following is the unpretending narrative of the life of a remarkable and meritorious woman, says William Lloyd Garrison. A life which has been checkered by strange vicissitudes, severe hardships and singular adventures. Born a slave, and held in that brutal condition until the entire abolition of slavery in the state of New York in 1827, she has known what it is to drink the dregs, drink to the dregs the bitterest cup of human degradation. That one, that one thus placed on a level with cattle and swine and for so many years subjected to the most demoralizing influences should have retained her moral integrity to such an extent so that she could retain her integrity despite all those circumstances and cherish so successfully the religious sentiment of her soul shows a mind of no common order while it heightens the detestation that is felt in every human bosom of that system of oppression which seeks to cripple the intellect impair the understanding and deprave the hearts of its victims, a system which has subjected to its own foul purposes in the United States, all that is wealthy, talented, influential, and reputedly pious in an overwhelming measure. That was a long sentence. But it was structured that someone like Sojourner Truth could come through with this glorious spirit that shows through in her ways of praying and speaking about her experience, but also to inspire religious people is a, is a proof of the human soul because she had been through such severe degradation in her early influences. So William Lloyd Garrison is getting into that category of a Jeremiah, but in modern editions of Sojourner Truth, William Lloyd Garrison's introduction is never used. I mean, it, this, this scholar puts it in because she's trying to be historic, but you wouldn't ordinarily bring out a new version of, of the narrative of Sojourner Truth that way. Um, if you look at Frederick Douglass's 4th of July speech, what to the slave is the 4th of July, which you've probably seen and it's often been performed by the great black actors, several of them to present for teaching purposes, but they do chop off the last third, always. Is this legitimate? Well, what do you think the last third is? A very grim, vicious attack on the church, a big attack on the Northern church. And the teachers out there, the elementary teachers say, oh my goodness, I can't have you know this appendage on here. It's part of the speech. In fact, for his audience at that time, that's where he gets to anything that's new. Because who is his audience in Rochester on July 4, 1852? Abolitionists, worthy people in Rochester, church people, people of goodwill. It's not an antagonistic off, um, audience that he's speaking to. So as he's talking in the 4th of July speech about what to the slave is the 4th of July, the whole first part that we still hear now performed by great orators is the mother home and apple pie part of the speech the part that nobody disagrees with. This is on the table as we all agree that slavery is bad and that we need to get rid of it and that in New York, we did get rid of it by now. Um, but then they just don't use that last attack. Even with his first autobiography in 1845, Frederick Douglass includes an attack on the church at the, as an appendix to his first autobiography telling ministers they're not speaking up, they're not showing vigor, they're not, that ministers and good Christians are not doing what they need to do to eradicate slavery throughout the whole nation. And Harriet Beecher Stowe quickly wrote him a letter. As you know, Harriet Beecher Stowe was married to a 
theologian and president, uh, a theologian in a seminary, and she had six brothers who were ministers, all ministers. And she pleaded with Frederick Douglass, and her point was, I know you can attack the church. I know the church is slow. I know they don't do what you expected coming up here, being a Methodist preacher yourself downtown, uh, down south. But they're your only hope. The church is your best hope. Please, please, Frederick Douglass, don't walk around damning the church. And so he responded. But his response is like, more like, I'm sorry I hurt your feelings, but not really an apology. He doesn't intend to back off from that. And sure enough, he doesn't because, you know, as I said at the end of the 4th of July speech and blended through his speeches, you will see a severe attack on the hypocrisy of holding to the tenets of the Christian faith and still being able to tolerate slavery. It's just such a stark, um, you know, contrast. Today, I want to uh, work through, are there any questions? I want to work through this introduction to uh, things we didn't cover before and maybe should touch on now. Um, from 1628 to 1800 and from 1800 to 1967, the peak, that's our framework today to try to highlight what the Reformed Church was standing for and how things developed in that time. Uh, the Dutch Reformed Church changed its name several times before it came around to Reformed Church in America in 1867. It's very important to me and, and was to the ministers at that time to drop the Dutch because the Dutch was becoming a little too much of a cage that was limiting the church to imply to people that it was only Dutch. And it was never only Dutch. From what we've covered so far, we know that it was what I call GFED, German, French, English, and Dutch. And when you look at the roles of any of the churches that you want to look at on the East Coast, you'll find German names, French names, Dutch names, and English names. We're going to go to the New Paltz area in just a minute and look at the churches that Sojourner Truth did attend or where her masters attended. And if you look at some of those names, the Heiden, the, the Hardenbergs, they're not Dutch, they're German. The Frillinghisens, it's not Dutch, it's German. The Dumonts, it's not Dutch, it's French. The Lefevers, it's not Dutch, it's French. So you look at the names and you know that the French Huguenots and the German Reformed, who didn't have necessarily their own separate church. I mean, we can argue that, but they were finding their home under the Dutch umbrella and finding that their German translated was easy to understand in a church that was speaking the low Dutch dialect that was um, in which these churches were preaching. So it was diverse from the beginning. So in 1867, they're absolutely determined to get Dutch out of there. Even though in 1867, would you say that being Dutch was a high status thing if we're talking about you know, superior races? Would you say that being Dutch in the 1860s, it's your impression that it had high status, medium status, or in a way, low status? Like Irish had low status in 1867. Any impressions on that? Uh, being Dutch, like the architecture of their churches, the nature of the people who were in the churches, if they were leaders and professional people and the church and the just that culture was admired by people. Well, how about the paintings? How about the golden age? How about all of the art and architecture and music and art that came out of the Netherlands? And how about the um, somewhat respect and the extreme, uh, and in general, the patriotism that the Dutch regions showed in the American Revolution, both in Ulster County and in New Jersey, where they really suffered and they really hung in there for the, for the patriots? I would expect that it would have a high... Oh, admiration, especially in the East. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Even the collegiate churches in, in New York City. Okay. But uh, 
Now, this church was never a state church under Dutch or English rule. I think we emphasized last week, they were orphans. Nobody was taking care of the Dutch Reformed Church from Europe. Um, its growth spurt in the 1800s was not primarily in the Midwest. That's probably a surprise to you because you know that all the people in Wisconsin and Michigan and Indiana and everything came in the middle 1800s. And you would think this balloon in the West would very soon be the majority of the church, but it was not. We need to remember how well established the Eastern churches were and that at that time they, the Midwest was, uh, and they also didn't, were not wealthy people. So the wealth and the population was in the East through through about 1900. This is the Klein Esopus Low Dutch Reformed Church, which was built in 1826. And this is the church then that um, um, Sojourner Truth's last, we could say master, the people who bought her out of slavery and made her free, the Van Wagenens, attended this church and they were known as anti-slavery members of this church. Does anybody want to give a quick architectural category to this, or uh, what would you call this, Sarah? I don't want to put you on the spot. It's gorgeous stonework. Arches, uh, but then the, the coins are. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Gothic arches, but then you've got the coins on the corners, which is kind of a classical element. So. Yeah. I don't know. It's kind of a mix, really. Okay. But okay. But to me, this says it's not a cathedral. It's not cold and all stone. It's got a warm look, but it's also very developed. It's very self-aware. You know, I think it says uh, prosperous, but not in the wrong way, Judy. I notice it has two doors on the front. Yes. Does that mean that there was a door for men to sit on one side and women on the other side so they wouldn't be distracted? I don't know how long these churches would have um, followed a much older tradition of men and women sitting se separately. I think I have a picture of the sanctuary. Um, anyway, Isaac and Maria Van Wagenen were um, in this congregation. And um, the, the church that preceded this would have been the church of her infancy. Here is the graveyard of the Kingston Church in Kingston, not far from, um, from New Hurley. And we do have someone in our class whose father was the minister of the New Hurley Church. I'm telling you, Dutch bingo is just amazing. You can't believe what you're going to come up with. <clears throat> and uh, you, he went to... Wallkill, well, high school in Wallkill. He had two Hasbrooks for some of his uh, for some of his teachers, and we're going to hear about some Hasbrooks pretty soon. The Kingston Dutch Reformed Church. I don't know what year this was built, but if they were, if they seem to be very proud to have the highest steeple, and you can see it for many miles. All stone. This is the New Paltz Dutch Reformed Church. And um, her one of her owners, John Dumont, uh, was a member of this church, had a farm outside of New Paltz. Um, the Lefevers were an early family that, it was a French Reformed Church right in town also, but the French people were part of both churches. And the German names, the older Johannes, the second Johannes, and Abraham, and many more. There was a Rutzen family. There were two Hasbrook brothers who were both lawyers. And the Rutzens. Here is the plaque at the New Paltz uh, Reformed Church. Um, Huguenot Street, first in French, the language of the homeland, a log cabin called the Walloon Church, close by the graves of the Patent Peas. And you remember that Michaelius said that his first congregation in New York was a Walloon congregation. And he had to write out his sermon because he had to do it in French. Um, so Dutch settlers built the second stone, stone church uh, north where the language of the lowlands, hence low Dutch, merged with French. 1839, the present brick church replaced the churches, blah, blah, blah. And there's that. So here it is from a slightly different angle lots of symmetry and the, the accents on the side 
with the white are really wonderful. When Sojourner Truth was fleeing, well, first of all, Sojourner Truth had about six owners. She had Johannes Hardenberg Sr., who had who was part of the Hardenberg patent. The Hardenberg patent, like the patroon ships that the Dutch were trying to set up along the Hudson River, you know, Killian van Rensselaer had tried to gather people and get landowners to develop tenants and develop that whole area south of Albany and with Albany as part of it. Then in 1704, um, the Hardenbergs fought in a war for the English somehow and they got the reward of a land grant along with Johannes Hardenberg had gone around to the Indians and asked the different Indian tribes to sign a deed for him of a tremendous lay of land. And when he got that thing signed, he took it to his own governor and said, here, look at the Indians gave me all this land with a nice title to it. So, you know, we have a basis for our legal process here. And he, the governor likes this. So he passes it on to the sort of secretary of state in England who says, oh, this is good. Now, if the queen just signs it, then we have England agreeing that you own it and the Indians agreeing that you own it and you own it. So Queen Anne signs it. Sounds good. If one of her, so now it's like creating a landed gentry in the United States with two million acres involved. So you can imagine how far into the wilds of New York this so-called claim extended. And you can imagine what kind of boundary markers they could even get to describe what they're, to put a boundary around it. Can't have a title without describing the boundaries, duh. So uh, in 1751, Johannes Hardenberg pays a lot of money for a new survey, but the new survey has landmarks like, well, this waterfall is one of the boundaries. Hey, a waterfall can move, you know, 10 feet in 10 years. It's not a stable boundary. Or the headwaters of so-and-so river, well, that also is way too fuzzy to be a boundary. So you can imagine now as the generations come along, and the land, so-called land titles are split up and split up again among the heirs and everybody would like to have a nice survey of this. So in 1751, there's a new survey and Hardenberg pays because the Indians have challenged his deed. These seven nations don't like this idea that those other guys signed this other thing. So he's trying to shore up and he makes, Hardenberg doesn't go to war. He doesn't start shoving people aside. He tries to make a new deal. He tries to shore up his claim and make peace with the Indians. So he gives the Indians 20,000 acres to cover their expenses of doing this lawsuit. So it kind of never goes to court. In other words, it's kind of settled and he's hoping. And then he orders a new survey and um, he pays 149,000 pounds to the Indian, uh, to the Indians to sign this new thing. So in a way, if you're paying out a, a good hunk of money for them to sign something new, it means you don't think the first piece of paper is worth the, the paper it's printed on. So a Hardenberg patent probably looks nice on the wall. Get, but can you take it to the bank, as we say? Well, maybe you can't. <clears throat> because maybe through tradition, and maybe he does. I don't know. But <clears throat> when we get to Charles Hardenberg, when we get to 1799, we have Johannes Hardenberg dying and leaving his estate to his son, Charles. And um, his estate includes some cattle and horses and so forth, and those are sold. And real estate, so all of his real estate and then the last thing that goes out for auction is Sojourner Truth, Isabella at that time, and some sheep. So the abolitionists really had a heyday saying that Isabella was sold on the auction block for some sheep and, it, you know, a girl of 12 and some sheep she sold all for one price. So think about it from Charles' point of view. I think that there's shield, I think there's some shielding going on 
to the fact that Hardenberg was bankrupt. Charles Hardenberg was bankrupt. Why else would your entire estate not be settled by the heirs and so forth? Why would it go to an auction? And why would someone buy this girl, Isabella, who doesn't even know that she doesn't speak English? That tells me this was a stranger who was just coming to a sale and acquiring this because they were liquidating an estate. And the, does the bankrupt person control that when that happens? No. Was the Dutch law about bankruptcy already developed? Sure, they're the richest country in Europe. A lot of people went bankrupt. So Dutch bankruptcy law developed very early and now is still present in, in New York law about bankruptcy. So you're getting a picture. It And the, the scholars say the Hardenbergs, there were many Hardenbergs who were not rich at all. And if you're if if your occupation is listed as landowner, what does that mean? On Charles Hardenberg's will, occupation says landowner, not tavern keeper, not farmer, not businessman, not doctor, lawyer, merchant chief, but just landowner. So he's relying on his patents and maybe what he can borrow on them. I think that Charles Hardenberg in 1799, when his father died, was a Christian gentleman in this congregation trying to see what he should do. It's 1799, 1700s are gone. He's looking at 1800. What is he going to do moving forward? In that same year, New York passed the law that governed slavery that was going to gradually eliminate all of slavery by 1827. That law was going to, um, yeah. So he knew that this little girl, this little 12 year old girl was eventually going to be free in her lifetime. And that James and Isabella might be his obligation as they grew older, her parents. And so he thinks not, should I just give them their free papers? That's what the abolitionists, you know, the abolitionists said, emancipate now. What would happen? If he emancipated them now, just said, I don't want to inherit slaves. I'm giving them all their freedom. To do what? Pack them a little backpack. Here, here are your clothing. And, you know, you can take this. And here, here are three ham sandwiches. And really, I wish you really good luck. I'll be praying for you. And those slaves had nowhere to go. My thoughts and prayers go with you as I give you your free papers. Well, people, the, the abolitionists were criticizing people like Charles Hardenberg saying, you only pe give people their freedom when they're old. When they're too old to work and now they're going to be a problem, you give them their freedom. And Douglas had made that point forcefully in his, in his um, autobiography. So Charles is thinking this through and he decides he, he did take out a $6,000 loan. That was a lot of money in those times. And he built a new establishment. And I showed you a picture last week of the building that my husband, John, and I owned in New Jersey, where it's a beautiful building. It has a commercial you know, window here, some um, area over it, and then the family house adjoining it right there. And I, my house was built four years before Hardenberg died. They're within four years of each other. So by Dutch people who intended to have a business there, I think it's a tremendous model for what his tavern was supposed to be and what it looked like. And therefore, I think there was reason why Sojourner Truth says that her parents were very happy to move from their little cottage, in quotes, on the hillside where they were trying to scrape together, you know, a way to raise some corn or tobacco or oats or something and sell it for enough money to get ahead a little bit. That is not working. Charles is looking at saying this cottage stuff is not working for the slaves. It's going to be like sharecropping that's going to take over, you know, after uh, the Civil War in the South, everybody will be a sharecropper where you end up, you know, owing more in rent than you can make off your land sometimes and that kind of thing. So he thinks if I can put my slaves in a beautiful place, where as they move toward being free, they're secure where they live and they have an occupation because I'm hoping this tavern is going to pick up and people will want to come here 
and you know buy enough ale and brandy or whatever to keep my establishment going and I'll have a menu going and I can make better use of James and Elizabeth's time, whether they're free or whether they're not free. It almost would be a deal that he would offer them whether they, you know, whether he would free them or whether he would just keep them. They were happy. But um, Olive Gilbert, the amanuensis for the story of Sojourner Truth makes a very big deal about what a pit, what a disgusting, stinking pit this basement must have been and how cruel that was because she's got a dig hard to get real cruelty out of the Hardenbergs. They're taking slavery as they received it. Now, I sound like I'm apologizing for something. No, I'm describing the world that they lived in and what could they do to look forward to the future. Hardenburg knew slavery is over. You don't have anything to say about it. The state of New York made that decision and it's going to happen. So it's not up to you. Your slaves will be free. Now what are you going to do? And um, he knew the Van Wagonets. Wait, let's see. Here's the inside of the Kingston Church. Now we're getting a cathedral feeling out of this. This is really, of course, Kingston was the capital of the state, wasn't it, until a certain time? And um, this is possibly women's pews and men's pews, but it's a little bit hard to tell. This is another church in Kingston. But the Dutch Reformed Church has gone from fairly modest churches to churches like this that are now going up in the 1800s. Here's another belfry. And I have taken this book and marked all the pages in this book that show you pictures of the churches. So you can pass this around. All these yellow tags will show you other pictures of very early churches and then some of the churches like we're showing here. So you can get a feeling for what was going on in these churches. Would you expect the ministers in a church where there are both slaveholders like the Hardenbergs and anti-slavery people like um, the Van Wagonens, would you expect the minister to say something about it in the pulpit, either for or against all the hot topics about slavery? No. What happened when ministers did speak up? Well, John Rankin, a well-known Presbyterian minister, and Presbyterian is just like Reformed only, not Dutch. The theology is the same. The type of churches are the same, and what they their liturgy is very much the same. John Rankin became a, convinced from an early age, growing up in Tennessee, that slavery is wrong, and he studied to be a minister and took a Presbyterian church there. And the first Sunday that he spoke up against slavery in the pulpit, his elders said, "We don't want you in Tennessee. Please move." So you're out, and your elder, your elders have the right to do that in this church. Oh yeah, it's not up to a bishop or anybody up higher than that. It's your elders and you can be told to take off. What happens when a seminary carries on in these early 1800s, a real debate about what shall we do about slavery? Example, Lyman Beecher, as you probably know, the father of Harriet Beecher Stowe is a famous preacher in New England in, in Massachusetts. And he decides that a seminary needs to exist in order to raise up ministers for the West as the West gets settled. And so he becomes the president of Lane Seminary in Cincinnati. So with Harriet Beecher Stowe, who's now moving to Cincinnati, she's still a girl, young woman, um, um, he tries to organize Lane Seminary. Into Lane Seminary come all these talented American men who are you know, looking like they could add up to some really good ministers. But they have their own ideas about slavery. They want emancipation now. And so they start having meetings in Cincinnati with Black people. And the trustees of Lane Seminary say, no, 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 that's way too controversial. You cannot do that, especially socially getting together with Black people. No, 
absolutely not. Cincinnati was very sympathetic to us, right across the river from Kentucky. The students say, well, we're going to do it anyway. So the trustees of Lane Seminary try to come down hard on them. And they said, tell what you were going to do. Theodore Weld, who's one of those students, and Lyman Beecher are going to face off against each other in uh, 14 nights of debate. The Lane Seminary debates are going to take place. They challenge people. Are we going to fool around doing this and that to fix, a bit, fix it a little bit, or are we going to emancipate the slaves now? And Weld got his orators together, and Lyman Beecher got ready, and he was pretty self-confident because he had really had a respectable career as an orator. So they go at it for 14 nights, and then there's going to be a decision by the audience who won the debates. And Theodore Weld, the very handsome, very eloquent young man wins the debates for immediate emancipation. And that's not the only, it's humiliating to Lyman Beecher. It's covered in all the religious press. And Lane Seminary debates may have had an audience of only maybe 50 to 100 people, but they made the news and people knew what had happened. Lane Seminary folds because Weld says to about 15 other students, you know what, Charles Finney is a class A abolitionist, and he's up at Overlay. Let's all drop our enrollment at Lane Seminary and take our tuition up to Overlay. So they did. Lane closes, done, over and out. They allowed a free exchange of ideas. The Reformed Presbyterian churches believe in this, debate it out, have a you know face off. Let's hear both sides. Seminary closes and now Finney at Oberlin starts a famous period of producing quite a few abolitionists out of that theological program. So if we think all the all of the our ministers were being silent, we do have another thing coming. We do have ministers emerging who are ready to stand up and do it. As we said last week, Elijah Lovejoy wound up being killed by a mob and his press thrown into the river. And that happened a couple times before he died from it. Now I'm going to have Judy tell a story briefly that comes from Ulster County, where we're going to zero in here, about um, a minister who stood up under tough circumstances. Uh, this is from a, a history of Hope Church. Hope Church's first pastor was Philip Phelps, who also was uh, uh, president of college here at Hope College. And uh, the, their first full-time minister was someone that they called from Terrytown, New York, a fellow named Abel T. Stewart. Abel T. Stewart served at Hope Church from 1866 to 1867. But before that, while he was at Terryton, he went through an experience that perhaps inspired him to look elsewhere for employment. So I want to give you some background here from the book. Um, the Chronicles of Terrytown and Sleepy, Sleepy Hollow tells of an incident in 1863 related to the Civil War draft riots occurring that year in New York City. Repercussions from these riots reached Terrytown and likely in increased Stewart's receptivity to the call from Hope Church. The New York City groups of white men in New York City, groups of white men opposed to the likelihood of being drafted by the Union Army staged several riots in 1863. That's right in the middle of the Civil War, riots. 1861 mm -hmm. to 66. Yep. Um, news reached Terryton that a band of several hundred rioters was reported to be on the road to Terrytown in pursuit of a long line of Negroes who had fled to the woods to escape a threatened massacre. The rioters were within a short distance of the town and no man in the community dared put himself in their way until... Abel T. Stewart, minister of God's word, accompanied by one faithful companion, Captain Oscar Jones, a soldier of home on furlough, marched out with splendid audacity to meet them. Mr. Stewart met the rioters and reasoned with them. He told them that their reception would be warm, that a gunboat, which had just arrived in the river, would shell the houses of their sympathizers without mercy if they persisted. He used cogent reasoning, convincing even to such a bloodthirsty mob of anarchists. And in the end, he succeeded in turning them back. And then he went quietly home. And because 
All too often, no good deed goes unpunished. Stewart's brave defense of the African-Americans and of the peace of Terrytown met with faint praise. <laughs> the people of per Terrytown were indignant with Stewart because in his reasoning with the rioters, he had addressed them as my friends. Mm -hmm. According to the Chronicles of Terrytown and Sleepy Hollow, quoting, quoting here, uh, partisan animosity and misunderstanding were so strong that the usefulness of the minister of the First Reformed Church was greatly curtailed, and at last it seemed wise for him to seek new fields of usefulness and to labor in some town he had never served or he had never, uh, that he had, hadn't saved, and uh, Terrytown's loss became Holland's gain. So where does he come? Holland, Michigan. And he leads things up at Hope Church that doesn't even have a church building yet. So a fresh start out in Michigan because he there's no question he risked his life with hundreds of blacks fleeing what was in effect a Ku Klux Klan, you know, with a violent intent as part of the riots of 1863. You have a picture, I think, in your reading of a fire in uh, in New York in 1741 um, that broke out. I think I mentioned it last week. And there's a picture of a of a black, a Negro being burned at the stake, which was one of the punishments that was derived to try to bring that, try to blame that fire on blacks and bring them, you know, teach them a lesson. And so it was a bloody, bloody, dangerous business. You didn't just stand up and make your case and have some applause and a few people say, boo, boo. It was a little bit more difficult than that. This is the first church in Kingston before they got grandiose, which you just saw. This was the earliest church, 1679. So some of the dates in the church to move ahead now. 1628 was the first church organized. By 1664, there were 13 church buildings and congregations and to serve those people, there were only four ministers of whom two left the following year. By 1703, there, was th there were three New York pastors asking the classes of Amsterdam if they would permit a fraternal gathering once a year for the Dutch ministers in the province. They want to run the church over here. They just don't think the classes of Amsterdam understands their situation. This beginning of an independent classes on the American soil became the CETUS. It was voluntary and had no authority as the classes of Amsterdam reminded them repeatedly, but it could settle matters by mutual consent. Brugink says there followed 15 years of um, complaints to the classes of Amsterdam about the Freelinghuysen issues, the whole issues between these more evangelical ministers and the more staid ministers, and what was going to carry out to be patriots in New Jersey and Tories in New York. There were, you know, there came to be uh, a face-off in uh, the Revolutionary War. The classes of Amsterdam warns them that they have no um, authority a number of years go by and many years of complaint later, many headaches for the classes of Amsterdam later because the Dutch are very good at complaining. How many agree with that? <laughs> they want the right to petition their government for a redress of grievances. And they won that very early. 14 Dutch ministers in 1738 in all counties of New York and New Jersey of which 10 of them favored the CETUS while four were confident, uh, conferenti wanting to stay under the umbrella of the classes of Amsterdam. So the urge to not merge, the urge to be independent is there. 1754, the American pastors vote to strengthen the CETAS. Sometimes if you just strengthen it, the ocean is wide and the classes of Amsterdam is far away, right? Conferenti pastors who wanted control to stay in Amsterdam had a peak membership of 10 pastors in 1765. Why should 10 pastors be so powerful that they could landlock the church, lock the church into that obedience to the Netherlands where they were not getting much money and they weren't getting a flow of qualified ministers? What was their reason for wanting to be, you know, under the class of Amsterdam? So they are rebels and then here are some further um, 
figures coming from Don Brueging to summarize what's going on. In most of the 17th, 18th century, 1714 to 76, 75 ministers were added to the Dutch Reformed Church. 20 of those were ordained in America and 10 were American born pastors who edu were educated in the Netherlands. They went over for their uh, theology training while the majority of 45 ministers came directly from Europe. In 1676, there were only two Dutch ministers preaching in the colonies. It's like, who's gonna object to slavery? There's no general synod to say anything. They don't even have a classis and they don't even have any ministers. It's up to the people. The, the resistance to slavery has to be a matter of what's in the hearts of the people, church by church and village by village and slave by slave. But since the state of New York had abolished slavery by 1827, some people had some reason to think we have other problems. New York has abolished slavery by 1827. We didn't bring it here. We struggled with it. We saw the wisdom of the new state laws and we're going to obey them. And we're going to help try to help the slaves who have to adjust to the new world. By 1800, oh, by 1770, 7021, 13 ministers are serving 40 churches. It's getting better, but they still can't catch up with what the churches need. Just before the break with Amsterdam in 1773, 41 ministers were serving 100 churches. By 1800, there were 139 Dutch Reformed churches in the whole country. And um, Isabella Baumfrey was born into that church in 1797. By 1900, there were 700 churches. Now to go from 139 to 700 is amazing. I mean, yes, the 1800s were a, a constant flow of immigrants, and you can say that, but Brueging points out that the, it was not primarily immigrants that caused the growth in the Reformed Church. It was the people who were already here. The church was finally getting the core of capable pastors and the churches that could attract people and putting together con larger congregations of Americans who were already here. Um, 700 churches by 1900, but still over two thirds of the money and population was still in the East. 1771, 22 ministers attended the meeting that sealed the new agreement with classes of Anderson. John Henry Livingston is the George Washington of the Dutch Reformed Church. He's from this same area, Livingston Manor, and there was a big Livingston tract estate or whatever along the Hudson in there. And he was a product of that family who was raised Episcopalian. He wasn't Dutch at all. Livingston's not a Dutch name, but he became very impressed with the polity that existed in the reformed church. And he thought this thing is built to last. This thing is built for a pioneer country. This thing is built to be flexible enough yet organized enough that it can, if funded but fueled by people who have leadership abilities, this can be a very good American church in the mainstream. And so 22 ministers attended. Um, um, John Henry Livingston goes over to the Netherlands. First, he learns the Dutch name, Dutch language. He's English speaking, he's Episcopalian, and he's, he's wealthy. But he decides he's so in love with the idea of the Dutch Reformed Church that he's gonna learn Dutch, and go over to the Netherlands to be trained as a minister. And while he's there, he's going to talk to whatever mucky mucks he needs to, to make a deal over there so that they will let the American Cetus have the power over here. And he gets that done. He knows how to put those things together. He's probably a good negotiator. He looks, his picture is um, there. And um, they reconciled and got, ready to move into the next century. I covered this. A Presbyterian pastor speaks against slavery in Tennessee and he's kicked out immediately. Um, classes of Amsterdam has been so busy trying to um, hold it together. This is the church in Sleepy Hollow. The famous story of legend of Sleepy Hollow is about this church. And this is where poor Ichabod 
crane sees his ghost and flees over the bridge. And uh, it is, to me, it is a really beautiful church. This, this is one of the most beautiful churches in this whole series, don't you think? It's just so simple yet beautiful and the windows and everything. Um, and there's the top and the steeple. So by 1799, we have churches like this and we have some kind of leadership in the Dutch Reformed Church. But during that century, the Church of England sent 60 missionaries to the middle colonies to plant churches. You know, got to, the Episcopal Church got to catch up here and they can let the little Dutch churches speak their Dutch and have their little services, but they're in business to, you know, develop a church and they have the money in the back and to do it. Yes. Uh, previous slide, I mentioned that the Dutch East and West Indian Company were bankrupt by 1799. What yes. caused them to go bankrupt? Did the they beaver, beavers, ran, ran, they ran out of beaver skins to sell? or Everything fell apart. Everything fell apart. The French were active, you know, toward the Great Lakes, and um, they just lost out. And there was a deal made. Um, well, they were just, they were closed out in bankruptcy in the Netherlands by 1799. So they had had a run from 1579 to 1799. Yes. Primarily it was the British East and West India Company. Yes, British East and West India. Business. That ran them out of business and they made a deal and they came to the Reformed Church and said, well, which colony do you want to keep? You can keep Suriname or you can keep New Netherlands. Which one do you want? And the Dutch reform, I mean, I, the Dutch government, not the Dutch reform church, the Dutch government said, we'll take Suriname. And New Netherland wasn't in the black. They were never in the black for the company. So it's no wonder. Yeah, I just want to thank Ron Alder, who recommended an outstanding book a couple of weeks ago by Russell Shorto. Its title is Amsterdam the most liberal city in the world, I believe, or something of that nature. But Judy, um, short of devo or devotes a whole section uh, to this issue. To it's a yeah. fascinating read. Yeah, it is. What about the immigrants in the middle 1800s that came to the Netherlands? Well, how aware were they of the uh, mess here as they came here? And what were the... You know, how, how did they react once they got here? Yes. Um, they were, in general, now this is generalizing, and we have thousands of people coming, but in general, they did not want to be in a place where slavery was being practiced next door or nearby. They wanted to come to a place that had resolved the issue of slavery. They could come to New York because by the time that flow of immigration started, New York had abolished slavery. There were no more slaves coming in. It had a black population and it still was going to have issues with racism and even violence. But the 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 uh, they were going to be able to establish themselves in a primarily uh, free culture. And the Dutch people coming to Wisconsin and Illinois and Indiana and Michigan did not want slavery. They, they were a combination of moral outrage that they had not ever been in a country that practiced slavery in their country. There was no slavery practiced in the Netherlands. So it was something strange and new that they knew was, was disturbing the United States. And they just wanted to build their farms and make their way in peace. Holland sent a pretty good sized contingent of young men to fight in the Civil War on the Union side, including yes. uh, one or two sons of uh, Van Ralty. One, I think, lost a, a part of his arm, I think, in, in the, yes. the fighting. Lost his arm in the fighting. He had two sons who volunteered, and the volunteer ranks were recent immigrants. They were people whose families had not even been here 20 years, and yet they were willing to go and risk their lives to save the Union. They were really patriotic in that way. They were not 
longing for the old days in the Netherlands. Ron. Uh, going back to Theodore Dwight Weld and Charles Grandison Finney and immigration to the U.S., uh, I think very few people remember, I think it was in the 1780s, the Articles of Confederation government passed the Northwest Ordinance, which, among other things, forbade slavery uh, in those five or six states that developed out of that. And be, in large part because of that, they attracted large numbers of immigrants, especially in the Western Reserve area of, of Western Pennsylvania uh, and uh, Eastern Ohio. And if you take a look at uh, Weld and Finney, they said, let's, let's forget about the flamethrower, William Lloyd Garrison, and let's establish coalitions and communities to work gradually to get rid of slavery. And where, and by the way, slavery is really not allowed or new slavery is not allowed in the Northwest Territory. Yes. Uh, and if you wanna know the origins of the Lincoln Republican Party, it's really in Ohio. Uh, and uh, I taught at a Presbyterian college in Ohio and uh, had a chance to do a course with a religion professor on the political and uh, religious inspirations of anti-slavery, not necessarily of abolitionism, anti-slavery. And we spent uh, three weeks at Oberlin College, which by the way, has the most large collection of anti-slavery papers in the whole United States. It, it is, but, at the same time, when Finney, who became the first president of Overland College, established his uh, grandiose church prior to that, they, they were not an integrated church. They were anti-slavery, but they were not integrated. But the Western, so-called Western anti-slavery um, contingent really was the contingent because they worked through the system to establish change and therefore it became more permanent. And at the same time that happened, John C. Calhoun was already favoring se secession in 1833 because the South knew that they could not keep up with the majority rule that would eventually elect an anti-slavery president in the United States. Thank you, terrific. So reminding that when, when, when Lincoln puts together his campaign in 1860 and argues that the forefathers were uh, limiting slavery deliberately in the Northwest Ordinance, which proves that they felt they had the authority to do that because the argument in the, in the 1860 election was, can we control for slavery in the territories? It wasn't a question of will slavery be legal in where it already exists. Lincoln was saying slavery will be supported and sustained, not not try not overthrown, unless by state law it will not be overthrown by the federal government where it already exists, but it cannot be spread to the territories. That's where he put drew the line. I think, all right, that's that. So even by 1700, the actual black people who were in this country were in a number of different situations. They were not all just slaves in a chain gang or slaves under a farmer and so forth. They were slaves in all stages of the gradual step-by-step -step what, what uh, Ron was talking about where people of goodwill who, who agreed that slavery needed to be gotten rid of, but you could not do it all in one step. And what are the steps then? What are that will not, that will impoverish or completely destroy the chances of happiness of the least number of people over time to get to that goal. Um, and so there was abolitionist rhetoric in which the Reformed Church certainly had a role as they struggled over the evangelical tone of the New Jersey churches. 
and the New Jersey churches were working their way out of slavery, as I described, as I do not know, in 1795, when my house was built, whether there were slaves in there, or whether they had been turned into indentured servants, or whether the people who worked that post office weren't even black at all, they were just ordinary people. I don't have any way to know. I'm just observing that the building was set up for that, and even long term. And even when we bought it, the area over the store was pretty much undesignated. Nobody had ever really designated as certain rooms, which is further indication that people who might have been part of the business lived up there or that it was rented in some way like that through the many, many years. Um, and therefore, I think that buildings like that dotted the Hudson Valley as well. How many, and all of the families who had names in, in Millstone where I was also are reflected up in the Hudson Valley. These families were big by now, and this was a whole region. So if the name is um, Hasbrook, you know, um, Romaine, the name Romaine, if the name is Dumont, you'll find them wherever, wherever you find the Dutch people, Dutch settlements, you're going to find these names turning up. And in the leadership of the church, you're going to find ministers, missionaries, teachers, people who established schools or uh, worked at Rutgers or whatever uh, in all these churches. Now, what are your questions about how today we look at this whole issue? That doesn't follow your question, but my question to you is, how does the Dutch Reformed Church size up in the 1860s against the other denominations that were prevalent in America? You mean in far, as far as size is concerned? No, as far as anti-slavery oh, and okay. where, where'd they fit in? There are a number of churches that split over that. Uh, there were developed in the Presbyterian denomination, the Southern Presbyterian Church uh, of people who upheld slavery. The Northern Presbyterian Church uh, did not. And I remember when we, when Bill, my husband was in the service and we were in, living in Fort Bragg, we went to the Southern Presbyterian Church. It was, it had an excellent organ, great preacher, but there was another Presbyterian church, the Northern Presbyterian Church, and that was mainly attended by Black people. And I think the Methodist Church may have had similar splits. Obviously, the Southern Baptist still claims to be a Southern church, more or less. And uh, and so there, there were splits in denominations over this very issue back in, in uh, around the time of the Civil War. And in um, there was a move at one time around the 1860s or 70s of a group of Reformed type churches in either North or South Carolina wanted to join with the Dutch Reformed Church. They were mad at, they, they had had some disputes down there and they wanted to ally with another Reformed Church. And so they proposed that these 30 or 40 churches come up and join the Dutch Reformed Church. And Isaac Wyckoff, an important minister in Albany at that time, firmly opposed that. He said, we cannot go backward. We're not going to go backward and bring in slaveholding churches at this point in our denomination's evolution toward resolving this whole thing. So that was turned down. And it could have been profitable in the short term. It could have been a good idea. Later on, there's, there have been various proposals since the Reformed Church by spirit is very ecumenical. Like I said, they're type of blood. They work with Methodists. They work with Quakers. They work with Presbyterians. And in this region, they all know each other. When Sojourner Truth is carrying a baby and she's uh, fleeing from Dumont because she just can't stand being a slave anymore. And she runs into an old guy named Levi. And he says, well, go and talk to, go to this house. And that's Isaac and Maria and Wagon, who had known her from infancy. They knew who she was, but he put her on the right track. And they say, well, you need to go to Kingston and file a lawsuit against Dumont because he took your son, Peter, 
and sold, you know, passed him along in the family to a brother-in-law who was a doctor and he sold him somebody who took him out of state through a sale. That's illegal. And so let's throw the book at him. Let's not just get the boy back. Let's throw the book at him. And these two Hasbro lawyers say, we're going to really help Sojourner Truth to take this all the way. And she doesn't even know how to sign her name. And she doesn't know what a what a complaint even consists of or where she's supposed to go. So it's comical the way they describe her going to the courthouse. And she asks the first porter at the door, starts explaining her complaint. He says, no, 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 you have to go over here. He didn't kick her out. She didn't get kicked out. Get out of here. You don't belong here. He directed her to the right place. She starts over again. It's still the wrong place. He says, oh, no, <clears throat> go see Chip. And Chip is alive with all these lawyers. He's the clerk who takes complaints. So they literally take her step by step when they hear her complaint and what it is about, they realize what they're looking at. And she doesn't want to go and, um, let's see, let's back up. So they send a roundabout and finally she winds up with Dame Rome. It's like a name like D-A-I-M or something, Romaine. And when I saw that name, I thought, here we go again. That's somebody in a Dutch reformed church who's in this network of people who, and he says, I need $5 from you. She says, I don't have $5. He says, well, go up to the Quakers in Popple Creek and they'll give you the money you need. And so she runs up there. It's like five miles. And we think, what are you charging her $5 for? Just give her the stupid $5, you know? But no, he couldn't do that because he's a clerk in an office. He can't so she goes to the Quakers and they give her way more money than she needs. They give her like $20 or something. And she comes back, she gives the whole $20 to the lawyer because she's so grateful that maybe that will make him even more motivated to get her son back. And he uses that money to, to not only file her complaint that'll go to the judge, but um, take this summons and serve it on the brother-in-law named Gedney, who was the actual culprit who took the slave out of state and, and threaten him, call him into court. And so he has to show up. Now, in order for him, a lawyer visits Gedney. One of these lawyers we're talking about, probably the Hasbrook or the Romaine lawyer goes and says, look, buddy, this is serious business and we have a registered complaint and you're going to be in court. And the penalty on this is... Um, it was a huge penalty, $1,000 and 14 months in jail or something for the crime of taking a child, taking any slave out of state to be sold down south. They were trying to cut off that temptation. And so he scares Gedney enough that Gedney does go and get the, get the little boy. But it takes several months. He's gone from the fall until the spring. So they keep telling Sojourner Truth she's going to have a court date in the spring. It's coming along in the spring. And she doesn't understand that time. And she's almost in despair. But finally, mm -hmm. see, they threaten him enough that Gedney goes to get the boy. He doesn't have to send like a, a child reverse kidnapper down there to try to find this. No. They threaten Gedney enough that he's going to be in big trouble with this complaint. And in other words, saying, and we lawyers are going to be taking it up against you. So he comes back with the child. And so this child who's five years old is reunited with Sojourner Truth in the spring in a heartrending meeting. And the child has been brainwashed by this wicked master, Gedney, to think that his mother is a monster. And so there's this, this, this scene portrayed as the lawyers and the judge try to calm the child down and explain that they are they know what they're doing and this is his mother and he, it's, he's safe and to reunite that. And she is so thrilled that she doesn't want to go ahead with the lawsuit. But they do. They want to go ahead and throw the book at, at, at Gedney. And I can't remember whether it actually did then if well if she won't pursue the complaint then i don't think it can, can go forward but it was a real thing and they stood ready to go to court and get it done and there was a judge who agreed to um to one to the to serving the 
the writ or what whatever I'm getting. So here are lawyers just coming out of the woodwork at a crucial time and realizing that Sojourner Truth is not somebody to just brush off and say, well, I'm sorry that a colored mother can't find her son, but I don't know what happened. It's not my job. And they're not passing the buck. They're responding and they're getting together and they're doing something. So you see something that you've got to admire. And these are churches where people have to communicate and work together because there aren't enough ministers to do it and don't depend on anybody, you know, somewhere else. So it's a moving story when you really get behind the to see what people were willing to risk. And then Isaac, Sojourner Truth at this point is really distraught. She's She has really been through traumatic experiences. And so Van Wagen and now faces John Dumont. John Dumont comes back to claim Isabella and Isaac Van Wagen and knows something's wrong here or she never would have run away from him. And so he says to Dumont, you know, She's here, but I'm not going to let her get back together with you. It's just, that's not what she wants. So I want you to sell her, sell me the rest of her time. She was going to be freed on July 4, 1827. And this is about six or eight months short of that. So she actually could go back to Dumont and just wait out her time. But Ben Wagon and, and his wife, can see that Sojourner cannot do that and should not do that. And they have no idea what's really going on there. It could be abuse or it could be, you know, beatings or whatever. So he bargains with the guy and says, I'm not, I'm not going to turn her over to you. I'm going to pay you for her time and you're going to go home and be happy with it. So he gives him $25. And Van Wagenen is a mason. I don't know if that meant he made hand over fist money, look at all the stonework we've been looking at, but he's a mason. He's not some highly educated person, but then they keep her in their home as a free woman for the next year. And she's now, this is 1826, so she's 29. So she is a grown woman, but she is just in, she would be in terrible shape if she was now set free to just go and hang out with some community or something. They guide her. And when she does a year later go down to New York with um, with her one son, leaving her two daughters with the Dumonts, which is required by state law because they're still under indenture. And that's just as well that those kind of troublesome now teenage girls stay with the Dumonts who are willing to take care of them because Isabella has no way to take them with her to New York. That would be not good. But when she comes down to New York, the network up in Ulster County still knows who's who and what's what, where she should stay. She stays with the La Tourette's, French name, French Huguenot, ties into these churches. They don't discourage her at all when she decides to take a ticket as a Methodist, because the Methodists down in New York have these fellowship groups that can easily incorporate a, a woman like her and they're safe and they're wholesome. And um, that would be a network into which she can be be brought. So then I'd say, well, don't you know you're reformed? You can't go and be a Methodist. They're blah, blah, blah. They know they welcome what is good for her. And so she comes to New York with a ticket as a Methodist. But as far as some of these scholars are concerned, oh, she was converted to Methodist from that horrible, you know, that horrible religion that she grew up with that was so mean and wicked. They typically stereotype the Dutch Reformed churches as just solid, just country gentry who couldn't care less about slavery or the slaves that they were mistreating. And I think that we're entitled to look for the lining, look for the lining even though we're not involved in trying to put a whitewash over the whole thing or say that everybody was good or everybody did well. We have to agree with both Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison that slavery was evil and they needed that element of denunciation and challenge to stimulate what actually was taking place in the North, which is that they did rid themselves of slavery without spending 750,000 lives in a civil war. We have to remember what it took 
to get rid of slavery in this country, which was a war. And those of us who really studied the lead up to the Civil War agree that it wasn't something where the young people could say, well, they should have just compromised. There was no need for all that war. The Civil War was needed. There really was no way out of it. If all these intelligent people we've talked about, plus Lincoln, could not avoid the Civil War and Henry Clay and all the orators, then there was no way out of it. So it wasn't any one church or any one theory um, that could do that. Donald Brunk again is also good at comparing the Reformed Church with the other churches in the North, the other major denominations in the North, who he says, no matter how they may differ from the Dutch Reformed Church, they didn't do any better as a church in getting the job done than the Dutch Reformed Church. There isn't any one church that stands out. He even points out that not even the Quakers who have such a saintly reputation for being anti-slavery were all sweetness and light. <clears throat> there were um, slavers and slave owners within the Quaker faith too. And um, so it's not an easy story to tell. Any other questions? Uh, Linda, I want to thank you very much for doing this. Uh, having grown up in the Christian Reformed Church and then found the love of my life and transferred to the Reformed Church. Yay! <laughs> uh, but not knowing much about the history of the uh, RCA or the Christian Reform, but I guess I would uh, put in a plea to the Humanities Committee uh, and to Linda and Judy to think about a sequel. Uh, because uh, surprisingly, uh, not quite the same, but I think our country right now is going through something like the 1850s. The divisiveness in our, our, our country uh, is explosive. Uh, and uh, it's going to take cooler heads like Finney and Weld to uh, prevail. Uh, and... Uh, now the major issues, I think, in a lot of the so-called reform polity churches uh, basically go around social hierarchy, which is usually male-dominated, and gender issues. Uh, and uh, I think we need you to think of a sequel to uh, educate us rationally about uh, what is occurring at, at the moment. One more comment. And where are the churches? As a sequel, I would really highly recommend going back to the appendix that uh, Frederick Douglass put to his narrative. And I'll just read a few sentences at the beginning of this that he decided that it would be important enough that we really had to include it. And he says some things like, um, Let's see. I mean strictly to apply the things that he said against religion uh, to the slaveholding religion of the land, the slaveholding religion of this land that is mainly in the South. With It has no possible reference to Christianity proper. Sounds like Christian nationalism versus Christianity. For between the Christianity of this land and the Christianity of Christ, I recognize the widest possible difference, so wide that to receive the one is good, pure, holy, and of necessity to reject the other as bad, corrupt, and wicked. To be the friend of the one is of necessity, of necessity to be the enemy of the other. I love the pure, peaceable, and impartial Christianity of Christ. I therefore hate the corrupt slaveholding, women whipping, cradle plundering, partial and hypocritical Christianity of this land. And who is that? Frederick Douglass, That's appendix right. to his narrative. There, there. Yes, yes. Thank you for, for pulling that out. I had mentioned it in that. Yep, yep. Thank you. When the southern states finished their secession and the Civil War began, the largest capital asset 
in the United States was the combination of the value of slaves and plantation land. So, uh, I mean, this was a war over slavery, to be sure. That was the root cause. But it was also the war over people who held a lot of wealth. Thanks, Ron. I think we ought to wrap it up. All right. But thank you, uh, thank you Linda, for uh, three interesting sessions. And um, if people want to engage you in conversation, are you willing to just uh, stick sure. around for a couple yes. minutes? Yes. Thank you. All right. All right. And remember to push your chairs in, please.